say the familiar Eastern salutation, peace be unto thee, or shalom. They couldn't even say shalom to their brother. They did So here we have a routine of family history. Just as the birthright caused conflict between Jacob and his brother Esau, it seems to have caused conflict between Joseph and his brothers. And while this act of Jacob seems to be parental injustice that led only to hurt and hard feelings, yet we cannot help but wonder if Jacob, in giving Joseph the coat and conveying on him the blessing of the firstborn, we cannot have a wonder if this was not following God's purpose for this family. In fact, when we look at the end of the story, we must conclude that the story of Joseph is a story of God's grace. In fact, even though Jacob seemed to select Joseph as the object of his personal grace, we know that it was the grace of God that was with Joseph from this moment on throughout his life that was going to make a difference, bring blessings to his family. I want you to note that when we look at God's divine selection, we see that God's selection is not based upon man's human potential. The word grace is used in the scriptures as a beautiful word which is found more than 155 times in the New Testament alone. The Hebrew word is tain. In the New Testament, in the New Testament, it is charis, the Greek New Testament. Listen to the words of grace which Paul wrote in Ephesians 2. God, who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ for by grace you're saved. And He has raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. That word, grace, in the Greek, charis, you originally meant favor or graciousness, but it evolved to mean the actual gift of favor that was given to another. That's why Paul talked of grace as a gift. God's grace is really something we can put our hands on. For God is a God of blessing. Dr. David Jeremiah wrote, Grace happens and it acts. Such grace can come only from God. It is the gift unsought, unmerited, unlimited. For no matter what we have done, no matter the depth of our transgression, the darkness of our hearts, grace overrules them all. God pursues us relentlessly. He will not give, up, give us up. And once He has captured us, he will not let us go. A beautiful picture of grace is found over in Genesis 33. After years of being separated, Jacob and Esau are going out to meet again. And Jacob had fled from his brother after being after masquerading as his, bro as, a, as his brother and going in and stealing that blessing. And then now it was time for Jacob and Esau to come back together. And, and Jacob took 200 female goats and 20 male goats and 200 ewes and twin rams and thirty milk camels with their colts and forty cows and ten bulls and twenty female donkeys and ten foals to give to his brother in hopes that his brother would forgive him. When Jacob saw Esau coming toward him, Jacob bowed himself down to the ground. But instead of harming him, Esau, his brother, ran to him and met him and embraced him and fell on him and kissed him. And the two brothers stood there weeping on each other. Then Jacob's children came and met Uncle Esau for the first time. And Jacob brought all the flocks and wealth to repay Esau for the pain that he had caused his brother. But when Esau saw him, Genesis 33, 8, 33 tells us, Esau said, what is the meaning of all this stuff? And Jacob answered, that I might find grace in your sight. But Esau said this, responding this way. He said, brother, I have enough. Keep what you have for yourself. Doesn't that sound like the Lord, folks? Now think about it. God doesn't save us because He wants what we have. God doesn't bless us for what He can get out of us. God doesn't save us because of our goodness. 
for our abilities or even our potential. I'll be honest with you, I don't know, I don't know why God chose to save me. I don't know why God loves me. I don't deserve His love or grace. Compared to God, I'm nothing but a, a wicked sinner. I don't have any holiness in me, and I certainly don't have anything that God needs. I'm dependent on Him. He's not dependent upon me. What could God have seen in any of us that would have brought Him to this sinful world to be betrayed, tortured, and murdered on a cross? Who was worthy of one drop of Jesus' precious blood? I'll tell you who. No one was worthy. And still He came. That's grace. Jesus came to die not for the good, but for the bad. For the Bible says there's, no, there's none good. No, not one. For all fall, have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Grace is the only reason Jesus came to the world and chose us as His own. Notice again in verse 3, chapter 37, how Jacob, Israel, loved Joseph more than his brothers and made for Joseph a coat of many colors. Friends, we don't listen. We don't have to worry about favoritism with our Father God because God's love is greater than anything. God loves us all. He loves everyone. And nothing can separate us from that love. Don't you imagine the other brothers wondered, does our Father love us? It seems like all that He loves is Joseph. You and I don't ever have to worry about that. Our Father in Heaven shows us love every day through His grace. Paul said in Romans 8, 38, 39, I persuade that nothing, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, or things to come, or height, or depth, or any other creature can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing could ever cause God not to love you. Nothing. Our Heavenly Father loves us all equally, and His grace is available to all. For the grace of God that brings salvation is appeared to all men. And when we receive Christ as our Savior, folks, we all get a coat. We do. We all get a token of His love. A coat of righteousness from our Heavenly Father. Isaiah 61, 10, Isaiah said, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. You want me to tell you someone who has joy? I'll tell you someone who has joy, someone who knows that his sins have been removed and he has been clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's the person who has joy. Amen. Someone who knows that he has been forgiven and cleansed and clothed with the coat of love, the righteousness of his Father. Hallelujah. Our Father loved us, loves us so much that he clothes us with his own presence. His own holy presence. His own righteousness. And that righteousness alone is what makes us fit for heaven. Our righteousnesses are like filthy rags in God's sight. That's what Isaiah said. So he gives us something that will be beautiful. A coat of much righteousness. Many colors. A coat of holiness. And by wearing that coat, we not only have access to God in this life, we have assurance of heaven. When the time comes for us to leave here. Grace. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found was blind, and now I see. Grace is not based upon our status or our potential. It is freely given. It is undeserved. And only God knows why He gives it. Grace is not based upon human, upon human prerogative. But God's selection is based upon His divine purpose. While God does not give us grace based on our potential, He does not. He does work in our lives to use our potential for His purposes. That's what He did with Joseph. Joseph was not the oldest son, neither was he the youngest. But God had a great plan for Joseph. And He began shaping him for that plan when he was very young. In fact, when God called Joseph through the dreams... Joseph's only 17 years old. Notice what God was showing Joseph and his family. Verses 5 through 7. Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. So he said to them, Please hear this dream, which I have dreamed. 
There we were, binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright, and indeed your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. Boy, don't you know that blessed those brothers? This little, little kid talking about, talking about how they were out in the field, and he had bound up his sheaf into one sheaf, and all the rest of them had to stand up and bow, had to bow down to his sheaf. Oh, I know that, that made him popular, all right. And then verse 8, And the brothers said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us, or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams than his words. See, this was their little brother. And here he was acting like they were to treat him like a king. Well, they didn't like that. They didn't like that. So God gave Joseph another dream. And then you ever, you ever heard of pouring salt in a wound? In a wound? You ever heard that? Pour salt in a wound? Well, here it is again. Then he dreamed still another dream, and behold it, he, and he told it to his brothers, and he said, Look, I've dreamed another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father, he just couldn't keep his mouth shut. You know what I'm saying? He might have been all right, but those, so he told it to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before, before you? And the brothers envied him. But his father kept this thing in his mind. To the brothers, Joseph was just bragging, making up these tales. But to Jacob, he knew God was speaking. Think about it for a moment. God, Jacob knew. Jacob knew about dreams. Remember Jacob's dream? Remember how Jacob dreamed, fell asleep and dreamed, and a ladder went into heaven, and the Lord was at the top of the ladder, and the angels were descending and ascending on that ladder? Jacob knew about dreams. It was there that God blessed him. Jacob knew dreams were important, and the brothers it just made them angrier and angrier at their little brother. But Jacob the father thought, I wonder, I wonder if God is speaking something important through these, these dreams. The brothers said they were not interested in God's purposes, only in their own plans. And they made a plan. They made a plan, a, a terrible plan, a plan to get rid of the brother. And that's what we see in the next part. We see that not only do we see grace in the place of divine selection, but we see grace in the pit of devious separation. Verses 12 through 18 here. And then his brothers went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. So he said, Here I am, Father. And they said, then Jacob said to him, Joseph, go see him if it's well with you. See if it's well with your brothers. And well with the flocks. And bring back word to me. So he sent him out of the valley of Hebron. And Joseph went to see to Shechem. Now a certain man found him. And there he was, a 17-year-old, wandering around in the field where the sheep and the flocks were supposed to be. And the man asked him, say, what are you, what are you looking for? And Joseph said, sir, I'm seeking my brothers. Do you know where they, they're feeding their flocks? They're not where they're supposed to be. Well, surprise, surprise, these brothers are questionable, uh, have a questionable character. They're not doing what their father told them to do. So they, they already left Shechem. And the man said, well, they departed from him because I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. They were talking among themselves and I heard them. This guy was probably another shepherd or, you know, in the field. And he said, I heard them say, we're going to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. And now when they saw him, the brothers saw Joseph far off even before he came near them. They conspired against him to kill him. Wow. I don't think they were happy to see him, do you? Most people, those brothers were something else. Jacob's sons were pasturing their flocks around Shechem when Joseph went to bring back word to his father. Though when they, when they were not in Shechem, Jacob, that the man's information, traveled on to Dothan. Dothan was a beautiful place. It was beautifully situated, about 60 miles north of Jerusalem and 12 miles from Samaria. And in Dothan, there was this mound in the city which rose about 200 feet high and covered 10 acres. And it was just filled with grass. If you can look out from that hill and see 
rich pasture land. 